If you wrote globalization and its discontents today, what would be different? Oh, I think uh, when I wrote Globalization and Discontent, I was mostly focused on the discontent in the South, uh, in the developing countries and emerging markets. Since then, that discontent has become global. We've had globalization of global discontent. And I think part of the reason is that we've seen that globalization has left us in the United States unprepared for the COVID-19. We weren't able to uh, produce even simple things like face masks, protective gear, complicated things. And uh, now uh, this broader discontent of globalization that I talked about uh, uh, with emerging markets and developing countries is showing up in a peculiar way in the lack of support for the West, for the United States and Europe and other democracies in the, uh, our position against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Well, before we get to that, though, is the inflation that we're seeing right now a symptom of these fissures, of these crises, whether it's Russia and the war in Ukraine or the lockdowns in China, or is it just an exasperation of a deglobalization or reglobalization in a new form uh, that people haven't fully understood yet? Well, the disturbances are to a large extent a reflection of the same kind of short-sightedness uh, failure of markets to attend to risk adequately that we saw in the 2008 crisis. I wrote in my book, uh, Making Globalization Work, the sequel to Globalization and its Discontent, that it was extraordinarily risky for Germany to become so dependent on Russian gas. It was so clear uh, back then that Russia was not a reliable trade partner. Why would you put all your money, in the, uh, all your eggs in that basket? And yet, Germany did, Europe did, and part of what we're seeing now, it, because we didn't respond to climate change, you had Senator Kerry here a few minutes ago talking about this, we should have, we should have moved to uh, renewable energy, right. re realizing that it was more reliable than political dictators. So fast forward to today. And the policies that we're implementing, whether it's to try to curb Russia and, and, and to, to hamper them in their advance in Ukraine, or whether it comes to tariffs in China, what are we getting wrong? Oh, I, I think uh, we're n not getting enough solidarity. Uh, we're asking a few countries. They may have made mistakes in the future, in the past, but now we have to have solidarity. We're fighting a war right now. It's a global war. It's a war to preserve the international rule of law. And yet, we're asking some of the poorest countries to bear, to bear a lot of the price in terms of higher food prices. They may starve. Okay. We're not doing anything about the debt crisis. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of managing a global alliance, we're right. failing. Joe, you came out of Gary, Indiana. It's flat on its back like no other city in the country. The Redekers, two academics writing in foreign affairs, talk about the initiatives forward where, hey, the fancy people maybe ought to pay attention to the middle class. How in this new America do we get the elites to join with the middle class like they did when you and I grew up? Well, I, I think that uh, we all need to be aware our democracy is at risk. And our system, economic system, is at risk. So if we don't get that kind of solidarity, who knows where things will go? So do, you talked a little bit uh, before about inflation. It's really hurting uh, the people at the bottom and the middle uh, enormously. There are... Uh, Oil companies making billions okay. of dollars. You, you, so well, you and I fought this battle in 1976. He had a VW Rabbit. You would have loved it. <laughs> Joe, the bottom line is the elites have forgotten the middle class across the entire political persuasion. How do we re-engage and build a trust with the middle class in America, given the present shocks here in Happy Valley? I, I, I think that we have to... Uh, remind them 
uh, as I did prior, uh, article I wrote 11 years ago, of the 1%, for the 1%, and by the 1%, part of the message of that article in the Vanity Fair was to say that it is in your own self-interest to show a more solidarity, because if you don't, this whole system is going to fray apart. Now, I'll say this, Lisa, this is important, really important, given the years, and when you and Rogoff were on stage here, that honor, when the two, they, they haven't gotten along for years. <laughs> it's like the Kardashians, it's worse than that. Here's the heart of the matter. We had compensation structures in America where the middle class was attached to the elites, and then we changed it to where the elites are making more money than God, and the middle class is left behind. And to me, that was a tipping point. This has been a tipping point, and here we are with a new tipping point with inflation, and just want to end here. Do you think that it's more important to get inflation under control at this moment than to uh, worry about or avoid some sort of downturn, which seems to be the Fed's conundrum? Uh, raising interest rates is not going to solve the problem of inflation. It's not going to create more food. Uh, it's going to make it more difficult because you aren't going to be able to make the investment. Then how do you clear raising the market if you don't raise interest rates? What you do is you have supply side interventions. Uh, one of the things that President Biden tried to do is to have more uh, care for children, and that would mean more women into the labor force. That release is one of the uh, uh, constraints, labor supply. Uh, you look at, we used to have surpluses in food in the United States. But all this takes time. We can time. get those back. How do we do this in a time-sensitive way? I, th I think we can do a lot more mm -hmm. than we're doing. Uh, can you Killing close? the economy through raising interest rates is not going to be a okay. solution in any time frame. So at least trying to do everything we can right. globally to increase the supply is going to do more on dealing with the okay. problem one, than causing a depression. One last that. question. Your heated rhetoric melted all the snow in the valley. <laughs> Let's go all scoop Jackson on you right now, the giant from Washington State. Can you, as a raging Democrat, support a fiscal rebuilding of our defense and of our Navy to push against China and the shock of Putin and Russia? Uh, I think we can uh, have uh, uh, support defense. We clearly... Putin has shown we need defense. Much of what we spend is weapons that don't work against enemies that don't exist. So if we take our current spending on defense and re-examine it, I mean, we're, pay, mm -hmm. we're so much back in the 20th century, the latter half of the 20th century, yep. we're in a, uh, we're a world of cyber warfare, mm -hmm. of all kinds of new forms of warfare. Mm -hmm. We need to adapt. Uh, our, our military expenditure. I think if we did that, we don't have to spend more and more and more. We have to spend smarter and smarter okay. and smarter.